I rise to speak today on a bill that is important and that has my support, but which opens up an area of public policy which really bears more full examination, and this bill gives us a chance to discuss that. I speak of Bill C-52, which is titled A Bill for Rail Safety, and as we all know, the issues of rail safety have become increasingly of concern to Canadians. As I, as I look at Bill C-52, Mr. Speaker, its full title is the Safe and Accountable Rail Act. But I think it needs to be acknowledged that while this bill is certainly welcome and is a step in the right direction, it actually only speaks to the accountability side of safe and accountable. It speaks to what we do in the event of accidents, who is responsible, how much insurance must they carry, who can sue after the fact under the polluter pays principle. It does provide a number of important improvements, particularly for municipalities and others affected by rail accidents. It does create a minimum insurance requirement of $1 billion. These things are welcome, but Mr. Speaker, the issue of rail safety continues to be one of deep concern, and so many of the witnesses before committee came to committee speaking of the fact that C-52, while welcome, doesn't go nearly far enough at the steps that have been taken so far by Transport Canada to improve ra rail safety in the wake of the disaster of Lac Megantique also are moving too slowly and even if fully implemented don't go far enough. So I I'd like to take a moment, Mr. Speaker, to point out, for instance, that if we look at Lac Megantique as an example, a $1 billion, and this was an example put forward by witnesses at the committee, a $1 billion minimum insurance requirement for Class 1 railways is something that without legislative mandate, the, the Class 1 railways have already been carrying. But if, and certainly we would never again want to see, we never wanted to see Lac Megantique, maybe never again see a disaster of that scale again. But now that we know it is possible, it would behoove us to put in place insurance requirements that would meet a disaster of that scale, which would, according to witnesses, be closer to six times that amount, or six billion dollars. Now, Mr. Speaker, looking at the issue of rail safety, we have had over the last number of years what I would almost put forward as a, a perfect storm of changes in the private sector, changes in government, and changes in the types of goods we are shipping. And they come together in ways that leave us less safe than we've been before, even with the improvements Transport Canada and the Minister have made. For instance, only as long ago as 2009, only 500 cars a year were carrying highly flammable fossil fuels, the flammable crudes that take up most of our discussion these days. By 2013, two years ago, and we know the number has gone up in the last two years, but in 2013, we were up to 160,000 carloads. Mr. Speaker, 500 in 2009, 160,000 in 2013. This is a phenomenal increase in hazardous goods moving on our rails, and that leads out other types of hazardous goods, whether chlorine or other hazardous substances. Now, the Canadian Association of Fire Chiefs took this statistic and converted it into million barrels and said, as of now, we have a million barrels of crude oil, flammable class three liquids per day moving on our rails. The Canadian Association of Fire Chiefs also pointed out that in 2013, the last year for which I have statistics in any case, a chief, but I found through the witnesses, there were 144 accidents that involved dangerous goods, seven of which resulted in dangerous goods being released. Now, we've seen steps taken, and I referred to them briefly before, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Transport and the regulators, I have to say, the U.S. and Canada, both transportation safety boards, by the way, the transportation safety boards in Canada and the U.S. make findings about safety, but don't have the regulatory power to implement them. So the transportation safety boards on both sides of our borders found some time ago that what are called the DOT 111 rail cars constitute an unsafe way to transport such hazardous and flammable materials. We've taken some steps, as has the U.S., but there's a long lead time 
for the implementation. So now we're taking class 1232 trains and retrofitting them for crude oil. That must be done by 2020 and for less flammable materials by 2025. Still, until 2017, so we have two more years to go, the unsafe DOT 111 cars will still be rolling through our communities. 80,000 DOT 111 rail cars will be still in service in US and Canada until 2017. Now, why did I speak, Mr. Speaker, of the trends? We have essentially less safety and more hazardous goods. The rail industry, in theory, whether moving passengers or goods, is one of the safest and most environmentally appropriate ways to move people and goods. This needs to be reiterated because it's an essential part of our infrastructure. And one of our arguments as Greens is that it's an essential part of our infrastructure that we've been ignoring too long. The need to upgrade in the, in the passenger rail context, the need to invest in more modern trains and better rail beds. We need to continually upgrade the access to passenger rail and invest in via rail for Canadians from coast to coast and ultimately to coast would be, uh, would be at least as far as the Hudson Bay train we get there. Coast to coast to coast rail service makes sense and modernizing it to bring it into the 21st century is an important investment for Canadians. It's an important part of our transportation infrastructure. Now in the case of goods traveling by rail compared to by truck, they're both safer in terms of accidents on our highway and in theory, reduce greenhouse gases, in theory, by far the safest way to transport hazardous goods. The difficulty we have is what's been happening in practice. Over the last decade or so, and certainly it's not just in recent years, we saw through the smart regulatory regime a change. We've seen through private sector pressures to improve productivity a change. We've seen through government cutbacks a change. And ultimately, we have greater risks because of a change in our industry. So let's just look at, in terms of reduced safety, the first point I wanted to make. Industry, particularly the freight industry in Canada, is now, no, whereas Via Rail is a crown corporation, freight is private sector. We are now dealing with a pressure of for-profit companies, and one certainly understands their point of view, but as a result of their pressure to improve the profit bottom line, we have heard from the uh, rail sector labor force, and particularly from the unionized members and the unions in the rail sector, a continual cutback in the onboard engineers, onboard rail crews that has led to greater safety concerns. We've also seen a failure to pay sufficient attention to maintenance along tracks. A number of the significant derailments that have occurred recently occurred because of failure to keep tracks and bridges upgraded properly. We even had a fatality, fatalities because of a, of a failure to keep a railway trestle in proper uh, repair. Going back to 2005, uh, in which CN Rail was ultimately fined uh, 1.4 million, which was certainly, I think, in the, in the, given the scale of that spill, a very modest fine. But in 2005, a CN train derailed at Lake Wabaman in Alberta and had resulted in a substantial spill. The inquiry into that found that the rails over which that train was traveling were worn out and that they had not been kept in adequate repair. That was certainly a significant event, but there were a number of derailments right after it in 2005. This started creating more concern about rail travel, and not rail travel for passengers, but the use of rail for freight uh, that extended right across Canada, asking what more can we do? What's the Transportation Safety Board doing to ensure rail safety? The second piece that made us less safe, Mr. Speaker, has been in a government decision to move to safety management systems. It's essentially a, a, a form of deregulation. It came in to effect some time ago, but I direct you, Mr. Speaker, to a finding in a report released in 2007 by the Canada Safety Council that reported that the system is one which, quote, allows rail companies to regulate themselves 
removing the federal government's ability to protect Canadians and their environment, and allowing the industry to hide critical safety information from the public. Now, one would think that having gone to a system such as this, Transport Canada would have a supervisory authority to review these uh, SMSs, these safety management systems, to ensure their adequacy. But it does not appear that that's the case. The third part of the less safe system, Mr. Speaker, is cutbacks at Transport Canada. We now have fewer engineers than we used to have available in Transport Canada to do the work of reviewing rail safety. Uh, according to a number of media reports, Mr. Speaker, uh, Transport Canada currently has, and has had since 2009, 30 critical rail safety positions that have remained vacant. These are for engineers who could do such things as anticipate and organize the removal of DOT 111 cars from the roads, from the tracks. Missing critical people in rail safety, missing critical people at Transport Canada who deal with hazardous goods is not a good sign to Canadians. We saw budget cuts at Transport Canada in 2012 that seem to now put in stone the fact that these positions aren't likely to be filled again. And yet we have hazardous goods moving through communities as the Federation of Canadian Municipalities who reminded the committee, we, as, as citizen groups concerned with hazardous goods rolling through communities, and yet we haven't filled critical safety positions within Transport Canada. The third part, Mr. Speaker, relies on what's happening in the private sector and why are we seeing more and more freight and particularly more and more dangerous freight on our tracks. I'm a huge supporter of passenger rail, as you can probably tell by now in my speech, Mr. Speaker. I've traveled Canada's rails uh, crisscrossing the country as often as I get a chance. And often I've done it in the context of political campaigns, whistle-stop tours, where it really matters to know that you're going to arrive at your destination sometime near the scheduled time on the via rail schedule. Now, as, as anyone who pays attention to rail in Canada knows, via rail has to rent the tracks from CN and other rail owners. Via rail is not in control of the switches or the red lights, the yellow lights, and the green lights. In other words, passenger rail in Canada and on-time arrivals is virtually entirely hostage to freight. So when we have increasingly long rail trains, that can no longer pull over onto sidings, and via rail, passenger rail, which is short enough to stay on a siding, oftentimes has to wait for hours for the convenience of freight to go by. We have not taken adequate concern or attention as, as a parliament or within Transport Canada's regulators to the length of freight trains. They are, and often to the fact that they're stacking cars and then again to the kind of materials that they are shipping. The horrors of Lac Magantique woke us up to what they're shipping. And on the morning of July 5th, 2013, I don't think any of us will forget the horror ever of a disaster that killed 47 people. Now, the, the Transportation Safety Board had already approved what looked like a perfectly satisfactory system of safety on the part of the Montreal, Maine, and Atlantic Rail Company. They had provided their safety management system to Transport Canada, and it was entirely legal on, 20, on July 5th, 2013, for an engineer to leave an idling train above a community having set handbrakes with the assumption that the air brakes wouldn't fail. In fact, the minimum number of handbrakes on the company chart, the, the, the engineer actually set seven handbrakes, the minimum number of handbrakes that the, on the company chart was nine. But the Transportation Safety Board has since found that nine handbrakes would not have held the trains if the air brakes failed. And as we know, the disaster of Lac Mague Antique is a disaster of a train barreling in to and a community that lay all unaware to the disaster that was about to befall it. Now, not only did the community not know that it was legal for Transport, that Transport Canada had approved a system that allowed an idling train to be left unattended with handbrakes on above a community, no one really knew what kind of flammable and dangerous materials were on board because it was reported as crude oil. It was, in fact, back in shale, which is an entirely different 
chemical composition, and as we, we know to our horror, formed a fireball that destroyed much of that community and killed 47 people and injured many more. Are we standing here today on May 12, 2015, sure that such a disaster as Lac Megantique couldn't happen in another Canadian community? And I have to say that for all the safety measures I've mentioned, and in the face of C-52, which is the Safe and Accountable Rail Act, we have to say no. We know a lot more about back and shale, and there is a greater requirement that communities be notified if it's moving through the community. Back and shale is not the only unconventional oil. There's also, of course, if you mix bitumen with diluent, it also becomes far more flammable than bitumen by itself. And I, I should mention parenthetically, because I think it's of some interest to people, that bitumen by itself, if it's, if it's uh, heated to be able to put into a rail car without the presence of diluents, is, is not a, virtually not a dangerous material at all. It can't spill and it doesn't blow up. But we've not taken safety measures to ensure that diluent not be moved by rail. Diluent is the stuff they mix with bitumen. And it was diluent, which is toxic and hazardous, that was being shipped north to, Al to northern Alberta through the city of Calgary that was in those rail cars that were hanging so precipitously over the Bow River during the flooding when the bridge gave way and the municipal workers of Calgary had to thread cables through those rail cars to keep them from falling into the river. The material in those rail cars was diluent, headed to northern Alberta to be stirred in with the solid called bitumen to be able to put them into things to ship them by pipe or by rail where they don't go to the, uh, the steam liquefied bitumen which can actually be moved into rail cars without adding diluent. We have a wide range of toxic and dangerous substances moving by our rails, Mr. Speaker, and I want to turn to the evidence of the Canadian Association of Fire Chiefs as presented by uh, Paul Boissonneau, Fire Chief from Brant Fire Department, who is the current president of the Canadian Association of Fire Chiefs. And he's pointed out a number of things that we could do to make the situation safer. One is divert some funding for firefighter training to assist people in communities and local fire departments to be able to confront threats. I mean, uh, firefighters should never be exposed to something as dr dreadful as Loch Megantique, neither should a community. But we do have a serious gap that the fire chiefs have pointed out in terms of preparation for firefighters. They're also looking specifically at the other hazardous goods. This bill deals with various forms of crude oil and the most flammable and dangerous forms of crude oil which are not really crude oil at all, but as such as back and shale or bitumen mixed with diluent. But they also point out that propane and chlorine move on our rails and also need to be brought into this bill for greater and through further measures for safety. We need to have much more information sharing about, and the bill does make some good first steps. The bill allows requirements related to information sharing between railways and municipalities in response to emergencies. But we do need greater levels of detail in that information, and the communities have a right to know. We need to do much more in strengthening the Canadian Transport Emergency Centre to be part of current regulatory activities. We need municipalities to be sitting down with Transport Canada and with the shippers to find better and safer ways. There are some that we know about, Mr. Speaker. One is called positive train control. It's used, it's in the United States in its Rail Safety Act. It is not fully implemented yet. But it constitutes an onboard computerized system that creates very clear advance and very immediate real-time information about where brakes are weak, where parts of the trains are overheating, whether speed is out of control, whether there are problems on board. Positive train control is now part of the U.S. Rail Safety Act. It should be part of ours, Mr. Speaker. We can also take steps to regulate for shorter freight trains. The, the braking is, is far more dangerous and difficult when the trains are so long that the brake signal makes it when the train is essentially too long to stop. Mr. Speaker, we have an opportunity to do much more in Canada to create real rail safety. So while I'll be voting for C-52, I want no Canadian under any illusion that this bill creates a safe rail transport system. It doesn't, and Canadians deserve our real safe rail system in this country. Thank you. <clears throat>